Hello, and welcome to this first virtual panel of historians on the future of commemoration in Canada. I'm Shannon Hartigan, your moderator and a manager with uh, Veterans Affairs Canada's Commemoration Division here in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island, which is within the ancestral, territorial, and unceded territory of the Abigwe Mi'kmaq First Nation. And it's now my pleasure to invite the Honorable Minister of Veterans Affairs and Associate Minister of Defence, Lawrence McCauley, to offer his remarks. Welcome, Minister McCauley. Thank you very much, Shannon and Dr. Cook, uh, Dr. Moore and PA. Dr. Birch, friends, good afternoon. I truly want to thank you for being here and for being part of this vitally important discussion. For more than 150 years, Canadians have served uh, this country in uniform. From the trenches of Belgium to the mountains of Afghanistan and right through our long-term care homes today, they have remained the very best for us. It's a legacy of service and sacrifice that we could all do well to remember. And it's our responsibility to make sure that we pay them the respect that they deserve. Recently, we've marked uh, very important milestones. In 2017, we passed 65 years since the end of the Korean War. And in 2020, it's the 70th anniversary of the start of the Korean conflict. Of course, this year we celebrate the 75th anniversary of both the liberation of the Netherlands and the end of the Second World War. But now it's our time to turn to the future. We do well to remember our veterans who have served in, since Korea. And how do we continue to find ways of passing on their stories? And that's why we're here today to listen and to learn, and to talk about how we can keep folks engaged in making sure that our proud military history and the memories of those who served do not fade with time. So again, I want to thank you for being part of this very important conversation. The torch of remembrance is in your hands. And it's our responsibility to make sure that it continues to be held high, lest we forget. And thank you. Merci, Monsieur le Ministre. Uh, de vos mots d'accueil, on sait que la semaine des vétérans est une période très occupée pour vous, et nous vous sommes reconnaissants d'avoir donné de votre temps aujourd'hui. And, and many of us across the country have been and will be taking time for Remembrance this week in the lead up to Remembrance Day. And certainly our plans to mark the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War look a bit different than we imagined uh, they would this time last year. So we're gathered here around our screens um, to reflect back on the Second World War and how it has commonly been remembered over the years. And just as we have had uh, to find alternate strategies this year to honor those who served, we have an opportunity to ask ourselves how commemoration could and should look in the future. Donc, cette discussion, c'est la première d'une série de tables rondes uh, qu'Ancien Combattant Canada animera et dont le thème principal est l'avenir de la commémoration au Canada. And today we're joined by three historians from the Canadian War Museum in Ottawa. Dr. Andrew Birch is the post-1945 historian dealing with the Cold War and modern conflicts. Dr. Mélanie Morin-Pelletier is the historian who explores war and its impact on society. And Dr. Tim Cook is the acting director of research. Nos trois panélistes ont rédigé des livres et des articles ont organisé des expositions explorant un large éventail de sujets liés à l'histoire militaire canadienne, y compris la commémoration et le souvenir. And we've put together a series of questions for a panel of historians, and we've also received some questions from our viewers uh, who submitted them upon registration for this um, virtual panel. We haven't been able to include all of the questions, uh, but we will keep them for potential use in future uh, panel discussions. So to get started, I'll ask the panel to talk about commemoration and remembrance. What are these acts and why do we engage in them? Uh, Dr. Birch, Andrew, perhaps you could uh, lead us off? 
Uh, thank you, Janet. Thank you also to everyone who's joining us from across the country. Uh, uh, I think it's important to remember that commemoration and remembrance are two uh, linked activities. They're, but they are at the same time, they're different things. They are looking at uh, uh, with sometimes common objectives. So commemorations are, of course, those uh, people, places, and events in, uh, in history that people collectively try to recognize to determine what it is that matters uh, and defines the values uh, and lessons that can be drawn from history that they want present and future generations to understand, emulate, or avoid, while also trying to keep that connection with the past. So we can commemorate and celebrate, as, as was mentioned earlier, certain events that we can clearly recognize as victories, such as the, uh, the Battle of the Atlantic, uh, 75 years on, the uh, the end of the Second World War with its uh, various stages through the D-Day and Sicily landings, uh, through the Korean War, the Battle of Kapyong. These are the subject of commemorations in part because they're chosen to reflect on the collective efforts of those that led to victory. And people use commemorations for different ends. Within regiments, it's preserved traditions and victories and past accomplishments. And the public at large is to recognize those, uh, those collective efforts of, uh, of Canada at war. But uh, when we look at commemoration, we're not just looking at celebration. The Canadian government, uh, through its commemorative programs, uh, the public and communities, also looks at those things that we don't wish to repeat. So we commemorate injustice. Uh, we commemorate things such as the internment of enemy aliens during the First World War, uh, the relocation and forced evacuation of uh, Japanese Canadians from the West Coast during the Second World War, the horrors of the residential school system and the trauma inflicted on Canada's indigenous peoples, and uh, more recently, uh, events such as the uh, purge of LGBTQ veterans and uh, civil service uh, personnel from uh, government as a result of their sexuality during the Cold War and after. So commemoration, be it about victory or about uh, past events, is a choice about what to remember and why. And those choices change over time and cast a wider net over whose efforts to remember, uh, whose service perhaps was overlooked. And when we think about uh, veterans, we uh, look more closely at the uh, Battle of the, uh, sorry, we look at the Merchant Mariners during the Battle of the Atlantic. So essentially, it's a conscious collective effort about what matters to Canadians. Remembrance, too, has a feature about, you know, choosing what matters and what to remember. Uh, and it has hel helped to shape Canada today. Uh, and it emerges as we recognize it today from the trauma of the First World War. So it is, in one respect, a commemorative event. We are recognizing the loss of life uh, over a century and more, but it is not abstract. Many in this country have lost a loved one to war over the past century. It's, it's a public act of grieving and recognizing that where we are now is in part because of those that were left behind who fell on battlefields near and far. So who we remember also changes as time goes on and we get a better comprehension of the costs of securing Canada. And I can go into a little bit more de detail about that later. Thank you. Um, Dr. Morin Pelletier, uh, Mélanie, avez-vous de quoi ajouter? Oui, ben, euh, mon collègue a, fait, euh, a donné une excellente réponse. Euh, J'ajouterais peut-être euh, un point qu'il a apporté sur l'importance de se rappeler que les actes de commémoration ne sont pas neutres. Euh, lors de l'exposition Vimy au-delà de la bataille, on a procédé à un exercice qui s'est avéré très intéressant. On a examiné des centaines d'actes de commémoration qui ont eu lieu au cours des, des 100 dernières années, d'un bout à l'autre du pays. Ce qu'on a constaté, c'est que pendant ou juste après l'événement, si on prend par exemple la Première ou la Seconde Guerre mondiale, c'est vraiment beaucoup les familles, les communautés, les vétérans qui vont rendre hommage, qui vont se souvenir du sacrifice euh, des soldats qui sont morts, des, des hommes et des femmes qui sont morts pendant la guerre. Il faut se rappeler aussi que pendant la Première et la Seconde Guerre mondiale, les corps ne sont pas rapatriés. Donc, les familles doivent trouver d'autres façons de faire leur deuil. Donc, il y a toutes sortes de monuments qui sont mis en place, euh, d'objets commémoratifs qui sont créés, euh, des cérémonies euh, et autres. Donc, ça, ça va être vraiment très important pendant et tout de suite après les événements. Mais à partir du moment où on s'éloigne de, des événements, on voit de plus en plus euh, que la signification euh, des actes de commémoration change. Donc, euh, euh, par exemple, dans, 
le Québec des années 60, où on est en plein mouvement nationaliste ou même avec le mouvement indépendantiste qui va se développer, on va miser beaucoup sur euh, les crises de la conscription parce que ça reflète euh, le mouvement politique, euh, idéologique de l'époque. Donc, c'est de ça dont on va se souvenir dans les, manuels, dans les manuels scolaires, dans les journaux. Donc, tout ça pour dire que euh, les actes de commémoration ne sont pas neutres et donc c'est important d'avoir ces discussions-là et réfléchir, de réfléchir à ce dont on commémore et pourquoi. Merci beaucoup. Um, we have some teachers and students watching from British Columbia and they would have asked us to explain why the poppy is a symbol of remembrance and why Remembrance Day is marked on November 11th at 11 a.m. Dr. Cook, Tim, would you uh, like to field this question? Yeah, wonderful, wonderful that young people are watching this and this is the dialogue I think we're hoping to have and to share ideas and to hear from you as well, and that's a great question. Um, the poppy, of course, comes from the Great War, the First World War fought from 1914 to 1918, uh, an incredible contribution by Canada in that war, 620,000 Canadians who served, and that was from a country of about 8 million, so about one in three adult males who served. Uh, the war itself changes Canada forever. We step out onto the world stage. We We are recognized by our allies and enemies there. There are symbols like the Canadian Corps, our primary fighting formation, Sir Arthur Currie, our Canadian-born commander. But of course, there is also the terrible loss, some 66,000 Canadians who were killed in that war. And um, out of that war emerged perhaps the most famous English language poem Uh, of the 20th century, John McRae's In Flanders Fields, and, and many of you young people I know uh, are, are memorizing it just as I memorized it as, and generations before memorized it. And of course in that poem, he, John McRae, who of course died during the war, talks about the poppy. And the poppy has become a, a symbol of remembrance for Canadians and for many in the British Commonwealth. Uh, first worn by Canadians in 1921 and then 1922 going forward. It's a visible sign uh, of our desire to reflect upon that service and sacrifice. Um, for decades, it was made by wounded Canadian veterans, the thousands and then the millions of poppies made by the hands of veterans to help one another, to help Uh, all of the great deeds that the Royal Canadian Legion has done over the years. Uh, and so it, it's a way for us to say, uh, lest we forget. And it's a way for us to, to wear a symbol that acknowledges around uh, Remembrance Day, it too emerging from the Great War, first marked in 1919 as Armistice Day and later changed in name in 1931 to Remembrance Day. It is a chance for all of these symbols, I think, to uh, help us reflect upon that service and sacrifice and perhaps to bear witness to those who have um, given so much for our country. Thank you. And, and so this year we're focusing some of our attention on the Second World War. The, this year marks the 75th anniversary of that war, which was um, a pivotal time certainly in world history, but also in Canadian society. It brought about a lot of changes to our country. How well do you think Canada as a whole has done when it comes to commemorating, whether it's officially or unofficially, this important chapter in our history? Tim, what do you think? We could have done a better job. Um, the incredible contributions of Canada during the Second World War are staggering. 1.1 million Canadians in uniform, including 50,000 women, Three million Canadians engaged on the home front in munitions production or producing food to feed Britain, defending North America, as Andrew mentioned in the opening discussion, uh, six years in the bow of the Atlantic to keep Britain in the war, uh, fighting around the world in the Far East and the Pacific, in Sicily, 100,000 Canadians in the Italian campaign, Canadians involved in air wars around the world, landing on D-Day, fighting through Normandy, clearing the Scheldt, uh, defeating the Germans in the Rhineland, liberating the Dutch, and I could go on and on. Just a, a staggering contribution from our country. And yet, interestingly, uh, it is the Great War and, and the, the trauma and loss of that war that seems to dominate our memory. 
Um, those 66,000 dead who we remember from the Great War seem to overshadow the 45,000 fallen from the Second World War, a, a not insubstantial number, of course, a, a tragic figure, and yet Canada in 1945 emerged from that war as a relatively wealthy country, especially with Europe in ruins, as, as the world was decolonizing, as empires were collapsing, and we moved forward into a period of prosperity, partially because the government of the day treated the veterans well, um, uh, uh, sent uh, 50,000 to university, created jobs, uh, retrained veterans. Now, not all veterans uh, benefited from that, especially Indigenous veterans. But for the most part, we were looking forward into the 20th century. That prosperous country that veterans helped to build up, that we have been so lucky to inherit. But as a process, we weren't looking backwards and we didn't do a very good job, I would argue, in building the same memorials and monuments, in, in telling our stories through history books and film and poetry and television shows. And it took a long time for us to come to grips as a country with, um, with the incredible uh, contributions of what we had done from 1939 to 1945, and really the key role of veterans in our society. Andrew, is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, I, I don't want to uh, go too far into how we've done in terms of um, commemorating Canada Post. I think uh, Tim's done a very good job in describing that. I think that uh, the really interesting thing about history is that it keeps building. And so in the years after 1945, uh, we see on the where the, the line stopped in the Second World War is uh, where you see the fault lines emerging in, in the Cold War as uh, post-war cooperation between allies faltered, uh, as uh, European empires abroad in Asia and Africa collapsed and national self-determination movements took hold and conflicts arising from those. A lot of that is, is creating a created a new generation of veterans, some of whom had served in the Second World War and continued to serve onwards. Uh, in Korea, uh, obviously that's one that we've mentioned, uh, basically emerging along the same lines as it was divided at the end of the Second World War. Uh, the United Nations involvement in peacekeeping missions around the world, uh, all many of which are reverberations of or uh, unfinished business from the Second World War. And the same is true from uh, when the Cold War ended. A lot of the uh, conflicts that had been held on uh, in reserve during the Cold War uh, resulted in many of the conflicts that our contemporary generation of veterans are now serving. So uh, historical chapters have a way of, of being kind of self-contained uh, when we talk about them, but in practice, they have a long reverberation and uh, it, it uh, is tempting to kind of always look to the present uh, and all the crises that we have, but it's also important, as Tim has mentioned, to look back and to take the moment of reflection to say, okay, well, how can we recognize this service of, uh, of the Second World War and of uh, past generations? Well, we, we can't lose sight of that. Thank you. And and it's, it is important that we not lose sight of that. Um, certainly the First World War veterans are no longer with us. The Second World War and Korean War veterans are, are declining in number as well. How do we best continue to honor this past um, without, you know, it, looking ahead into the future without having this living memory to draw upon? Andrew, what, what are your thoughts on that challenge? Oh, well, I mean, I'm heartened uh, to think that nearly 10 years after the last Canadian uh, who's, who uh, uh, veteran of the First World War has passed away, public efforts at commemoration of the First World War have grown stronger. I think it's probably safe to say in some respects that the, uh, that the First World War is passing a bit into commemorative territory as national events as opposed to active remembrance. But at the same time, I can't tell you how many people have come through the War Museum and who have... Uh, uh, come forward during a tour or have offered some aspect of their family history and to mention that their great-grandfather had served during the war and how that, that had changed them or their family or to, to seek that nudge to go and chase down their, their family history. So uh, I think that there's definitely the, the even for generations past, uh, there's still that, that spark of remembrance that's being uh, carried forward. 
Now, the Korean War, compared to the First and Second World Wars, was a much smaller conflict for Canada, more, more, uh, as opposed to 1.1 million serving. We have about 30,000, uh, a little more than that, who serve over the course of the war and after in the armistice, um, which puts it kind of the scope uh, of the Yugoslavia missions uh, that Canada undertook in the 1990s and 2000s, although obviously with a much greater loss of life owing to the, uh, the active war status. But um, so uh, the Korean War veterans themselves did a lot of effort uh, to push uh, for greater remembrance along with the cohort of veterans of the Second World War into the 80s and 1990s. And I think by and large that objective has been achieved through their efforts. So I don't think you can call Korea the Forgotten War anymore. Uh, but to make sure it stays that way, well, that's on us. So the Korea War veterans are passing away, the Second World War veterans are fewer in number, and that torch is being picked up by their descendants, by community partnerships, and to a certain extent by, uh, by institutions. And I, I think that uh, it's very interesting to see uh, examples of that. Over the weekend, you mentioned there's a, a group of school students from BC tuning in. I attended a virtual event with uh, uh, students from Charles Best and Coquitlam, uh, who had connected with veterans of the Korean War and interviewed them and used those interviews to spark uh, first um, uh, first person accounts or poems or biographical profiles of these veterans and what they went through in Korea. And uh, they called it intergenerational integrity. So about actively passing the torch amid this isolation of COVID to try to uh, build a bridge uh, between uh, the past and the present through curiosity and generosity and, uh, and a lot of heart. So. I think that uh, there's been a lot of resources that have been left behind by this generation of veterans, testimony, oral histories with the, the War Museum, with Historic Canada, with Veterans Affairs Canada. Uh, there's a lot of work that's left to do in terms of preserving that history and carrying it forward. Uh, but I'm heartened that uh, people want to know about this and uh, believe in that mission. And uh, I certainly do. So that's, uh, I'm looking forward to carrying forward that mission. Thank you. How about you, Tim? What, uh, what would you like to add? What is the debt? What is the debt that we owe our veterans? I think many in Canada believe that for injured veterans who come back, those who survive their physical wounds, that they must be treated and cared for. And I think now we have a much greater understanding of invisible wounds and post-traumatic stress disorder and stress injuries as well. But there's a, another element to that debt, and it is the debt of remembrance. It is the debt of reflection upon uh, what these Canadians have done. And I think, as Andrew has rightly said, um, we are moving into a period where we are, are losing our war veterans and our Korean war veterans. Of the 1.1 million who served in the war, as I mentioned before, 45,000 fell during the war, but time has taken for now, and we're down to fewer than 30,000, and they're, they're all over the age of 95 and 97 at the War Museum, where all three of us work, where it's our great honor to work. We've had a chance to talk to veterans, for, uh, in my case, for the last 20 years that I've been working there. It's always the highlight of my day. Um, the, the Second World War uh, generation that has you know, largely moved on now, the Korean War, those veterans of the Cold War, hundreds of thousands, those veterans of peacekeeping missions and peacemaking operations, and now of Afghanistan. And it, it, it really is incumbent upon us, as Andrew has said, it's on us to carry forward um, uh, these stories, to make sure that we teach the next generation. And that's something that's absolutely crucial to both capture the stories before they are lost, but also to find ways to share them with those who will be carrying our history forward. Thank you, Tim. And, and I'll, um, I want to acknowledge that a, a quest, one of our viewers from Welland, Ontario asked for some ideas on specific things we can do to help um, keep the Second World War from disappearing from the thoughts of our younger generations. And I know you've, you've kind of touched on that a bit, Tim, but is there more you'd like to say about uh, things that we can do to keep that memory? Yeah, and, and uh, I want to let, let a space for maybe Melanie to jump in here too, but I, I think that I see tremendous things with our teachers. Uh, I'm often asked around Remembrance Day, um, you know, how, how, do young, how do we teach young people? And I see great things happening in our schools. I see teachers who are aware of the importance of Remembrance Day, various means to connect to the past. Um, one of the really exciting programs that I've, I've heard of is looking at the names of fallen 
um, soldiers and service personnel on local cenotaphs and and tracking down who those people were they came from your community and of course in every city every town every village across our country there is a memorial to the fallen of the first world war the second world korea and now uh, increasingly more recent conflicts and you can you can um, access those personnel files at the national archives at now the library archives of canada and that, to me, is a really powerful means to make a connection. Uh, myself, I've been very lucky to go overseas many times, to, to see the cemeteries there, to see the young people uh, who were buried there, who never had a future, who, who served and lost their lives. Andrew has mentioned an oral history program that we have at the Canadian War Museum, and there are many other museums and archives that engage in this. Um, and so I, I think those are some tangible uh, ideas there. but. But I know that Melanie has been working on a key project at the War Museum that I think she'd probably like to share. Sure. Well, over you, to you, Melanie. On sait qu'un de vos rôles au musée canadien de la guerre, c'est de explorer l'impact de la guerre sur la société. Quel, euh, comment devrions aborder les aspects de commémoration avec les jeunes? Et, et en fait, un de nos spectateurs de Saint John au Nouveau-Brunswick se préoccupe justement de cette question, de la question de passer le flambeau du souvenir aux, aux générations euh, futures. Qu'en pensez-vous? En effet, c'est euh, très important pour nous au Musée de la guerre, puis on y réfléchit depuis des années. Euh, je pense que c'est vraiment important, de, si, si on a l'occasion de faire vivre des expériences concrètes, euh, de faire euh, le pont entre euh, le passé et le vécu des jeunes, des adolescents, euh, ça fait une très grande différence. Idéalement, on les apporterait tous euh, faire la tournée des champs de bataille, euh, visiter les, les, les euh, monuments outre-mer, euh, voir les cimetières. C'est tellement formateur euh, comme expérience. Euh, donc, mais euh, malheureusement, euh, en attendant, il y a quand même des choses très intéressantes qu'on peut faire dans, la, dans les, la situation actuelle. Comme maman d'un enfant, moi-même d'âge scolaire, j'ai eu l'occasion de participer à plusieurs reprises au cours des années aux céré cérémonies qui sont faites dans les écoles. C'est vraiment incroyable le travail des enseignants, là, surtout en, en temps de pandémie. Il faut leur lever notre chapeau certainement. Mais donc, ce que j'ai trouvé qui était très puissant, c'est quand on a l'occasion d'impliquer, par exemple, des parents, des grands-parents des élèves qui, qui servent ou qui ont servi outre-mer, quand les élèves ont l'occasion de, de parler avec eux, d'écouter leur expérience, donc c'est très, très enrichissant. Donc ça, c'est quelque chose qui, qui peut se passer même de façon virtuelle là, en temps de pandémie. Et aussi, euh, je, oh, ce qui est intéressant aussi, c'est que les enfants dont les parents servent peuvent aussi en parler avec, avec leurs euh, leur collègues de classe parce que ça rapproche beaucoup, ça, ça rend les événements moins lointains. Donc, on s'aperçoit comme enfant que ça, ça joue sur, euh, ça l'affecte des familles comme la nôtre. Donc, ça, ça c'est très Très intéressant, puis ça se fait en salle de classe ou même de façon virtuelle à la maison. J'aimerais aussi mentionner qu'au Musée de la guerre, depuis plusieurs années déjà, on offre des euh, euh, boîtes de euh, découverte associées au projet de la ligne de ravitaillement. Donc ça, les, les enseignants peuvent aller sur notre site web et avoir plus d'informations. Mais donc, les boîtes de découvertes, il y en a de la Première Guerre mondiale et de la Seconde Guerre mondiale, de, depuis tout récemment. Et donc, les, les enseignants qui travaillent en classe ou bien à la maison peuvent commander ces boîtes-là. Il y a des histoires personnelles, mais il y a aussi des objets d'époque euh, que les, les euh, élèves peuvent manipuler. Et donc, c'est vraiment intéressant parce que ça rend la guerre concrète. Il liste des histoires de, de jeunes hommes, jeunes femmes et même d'enfants qui ont vécu la guerre d'un bout à l'autre du pays. Et aussi, ils voient l'impact que, que la guerre peut avoir sur les familles. Donc, ça, c'est quelque chose que euh, 
je suggère aux, aux enseignants, si ça les intéresse, d'aller voir au www.musée-de-la-guerre.ca. Et on a aussi, tout récemment, à la fin octobre, euh, mis en ligne un tout nouveau module euh, du jour du souvenir. Et encore là, euh, les enseignants ou même les parents qui, qui enseignent euh, à la maison présentement, on vous donne l'occasion euh, d'examiner de, une quarantaine d'artefacts avec vos enfants, de, voir des, de lire des histoires personnelles. Je pense que c'est vraiment intér intéressant, mais aussi très important euh, à ce moment ici, en temps de pandémie, parce que les, les, les enfants sont bombardés d'informations euh, pas toujours correctes. Euh, mais donc ici, on vous donne l'occasion de, de discuter euh, des, des histoires, des objets. On vous donne l'occasion donc de, de travailler, de, de donner des outils à la, aux enfants pour développer leur esprit critique. Puis je pense que c'est plus important que jamais. Une autre chose particulièrement intéressante, euh, donc je termine là-dessus, on offre sur, euh, encore là, dans, dans ce module du jour du souvenir, des scénarios qui permettent de créer votre propre cérémonie du souvenir, soit à la maison ou en salle de classe. Donc, euh, euh, c'est particulièrement intéressant parce qu'on donc on a tout le, le scénario. Euh, donc, ça peut. J'espère que ça va être un outil qui va permettre aux, aux enseignants de, de leur aider là, à, à créer, le, à leur donner du matériel puis leur aider euh, à avec des, euh, à faire des cérémonies puis des, des expériences enrichissantes avec leurs euh, élèves euh, en ce moment où, où c'est différent des autres années, c'est certain. Merci, Mélanie. And it's interesting, Mélanie talked about um, creative tools and resources to help people learn about war. And Andrew, you've created a digital map of Canada's Korean War fallen. Um, can you tell us about that and what motivated you to do this? Yeah, of course. Uh, the uh, uh, One of my duties at the War Museum is, of course, to look at Canada's post-1945 history and uh, looking at the, uh, having done several exhibitions and projects concerning the, uh, the Korean War, Uh, we know from the books of remembrance that are housed in the uh, in uh, the memorial uh, hall at uh, the Parliament of Canada. One of those books deals with with Korea, and there's 516 names in that book. And uh, we know through the histories and the war diaries that have been uh, been written that of that number, uh, a fair proportion, more than half, 312, uh, were either uh, killed in action, died of wounds, or are missing, presumed dead in the aftermath of raids and patrols that went awry during the war. Uh, and the remainder of about 204 had died of other causes, and those are not as well elaborated. So this began as a means for, for me to try to connect with and build on uh, those numbers and try to populate them and have a better understanding of what happened to each of these 516 uh, people who volunteered uh, for the Canadian uh, Armed uh, Conflict in Korea, uh, in the Navy, in the Air Force, in the, uh, in the, uh, the Army. Uh, to be able to determine uh, how they passed away. And so I accessed the service files with cooperation from the personnel at Library and Archives Canada. Uh, I was able to build kind of uh, biographical sheets of each uh, of each individual to get a better sense of where they were born, where they served, what level of education they had, what were their jobs before enlisting, uh, and what was the cause of death and what were the circumstances surrounding it. And uh, so we see accidental deaths and, and uh, those who died by suicide, unfortunately, uh, those who were uh, um, Uh, subject to uh, illness uh, during the war and afterwards. And so uh, through reviewing the files, I also found coordinates in many cases, grid references uh, or locations where those individuals died in field hospitals, uh, in forward positions back home in, in civilian hospitals. And so I thought it would be interesting to try to make a connection because a lot of people at the time didn't know where Korea was or, or find it hard to identify with numbered hills like Hill 187 and Hill 355. Uh, even kept young uh, are a little hard to visualize and so to create a map to be able to find out where each of these men were born where they enlisted uh what their address was on enlistment uh, so kind of where they live when they made that choice and also where they fell 
uh, as a way to try to communicate visually uh, the costs of the Korean War uh, in a way that uh, uh, that uh, hopefully will connect with people and be able so that they can understand uh, more about uh, the choices that people uh, had made and the costs and, and the debt that is owed to uh, Canadians who served in Korea and didn't return. Uh, so that's uh, that's the project. It's uh, it's available online. It's uh, publicly sourced. If you look up Canada's Korean War Dead uh, map, you'll be able to find it. Uh, and uh, we have some plans about how to enhance that. And it's right in kind of a beta right now. Uh, but the uh, objective is to uh, for people to be able to visualize that loss and also the uh, the fact that people from across Canada and indeed across the world uh, from where they were born uh, made up that force that went to Korea uh, to restore uh, stability uh, during the Korean War. Thank you, Andrew. And it's so important and challenging to make these the fallen real again today to remember them and, and make make these n abstract numbers more concrete through the maps and and Tim you've written about Vimy um, and how Canadians uh, traveling overseas will often visit memorials or cemeteries where Canadians are buried um, can you tell us about about this and the importance of of that yeah well just just to follow up on what Andrew says I, I think a lot of Canadians, it's not easy to get to, to South Korea. As he was saying, his map, last time we talked to Andrew, I think it had more than 50,000 visits to his map. So there is a there is a great desire out there to, to know our history, to understand where Canadians have served around the world, and, and Andrew's done really a key project there. Uh, for me, as a, as a historian of the First World War and the Second War, I've been drawn back to the battlefields of Europe and to Italy. Um, it's not as easy to get to Italy, uh, but, you know, Western Europe is a very powerful place for Canadians. If we think of the 620,000 Canadians who served in the First World War, 1.1 million in the Second World War, um, many of them served on the Western Front or the various Western Fronts. And, and these are real places of power, of history. They draw us back as Canadians. And there are millions and millions of Canadians across this country who have a genealogical or a family link to someone who served in the two world wars. For me, Vimy has always been a very powerful place. I first visited it when I was 17 years old. My parents took me there. I wasn't much interested in history at, at that point in my life, but at Vimy, uh, I, I was physically moved to stand there at that powerful memorial first uh, uh, unveiled in 1936, Walter Allward who designed it, the, the, the figures who are there, uh, Mother Canada who grieves for her fallen sons, the engraved names of 11,285 Canadians with no known graves just in France. To run your hands over those names to me is one of the most powerful acts uh, of bearing witness to service and sacrifice that, that has ever um, happened to me. And of course there are the, the, the silent cities, those cemeteries across the Western Front um, they too, you walk them, you contemplate, you reflect upon um, what motivated these young men and occasionally young women uh, to serve, uh, what might have been for them and their families if they had been able to come home. Uh, it, is, it is a powerful draw for Canadians and I would say just to return to Vimy and also Beaumont Hamel, uh, where Newfoundland played such a key role on the Val de Somme that these are these are silent centuries these are canadian uh, ambassadors in stone and marble they are places of grief of pride of sorrow of history one never feels so canadian when standing at vimy it is it is not a place where where i think one need um, think of glorious history although there's enough courage and bravery to to make anyone weep with what happened at Vimy Ridge and at Vimy as a symbol for the Canadian war effort. But they're also a reminder, not just to Canadians, but to Europeans of what Canadians have done in the past to bring and to fight for freedom and the liberal ideas that motivated them. And we should not forget that. And, and Vimy plays a key role there. Uh, as I come back to my answer earlier about the Second World War, for decades and decades, we never built any memorials 
at Juneau Beach or Dieppe or in other battlefields. And we missed an opportunity there. Since 2003, there is the Juneau Beach Center. And yet I wonder if we're talking today about the history and the future of commemoration, what will we do for our Cold War conflicts, for peacekeeping operations, for Afghanistan? Um, these are some of the questions that we don't have time to to, to give an answer today, but it's maybe something worth grappling with and thinking about each of us of what what is the duty and what is the debt of remembrance that we as a country and that we as Canadians should carry out for those who served, those who fell, and those who have returned home. Well, and and actually, Tim, I think I think we owe it to ourselves to spend a, a couple of minutes. Uh, to begin to talk about that, how how will we, how must we um, remember uh, the hundreds of thousands of Canadian Armed Forces or commemorate or recognize the Canadian Armed Forces members who have been serving to protect peace and freedom here in Canada, certainly in multilateral peacekeeping efforts, humanitarian efforts, the wars in the Persian Gulf and Afghanistan, we, we must. Um, focus our commemorative attention on on these efforts and so perhaps I'll start with you Andrew what are your thoughts on how best we can be honoring the sacrifices and achievements of these modern era service men and women and actually a teacher in Surrey BC, BC has asked about peacekeepers in particular and how we can be understanding their day-to-day -day experience and how to honor what they've done over to you, Andrew. Right. Um, well, I think our starting point should be first, uh, when we talk about recognizing the service of those uh, contemporary veterans, is to first make sure that those who served in these conflicts, uh, whether they are uh, peacekeeping missions from the, the Cold War period, Afghanistan, present day, uh, people of, who served in Canada and abroad, is to make sure that they're supported so that when they leave military service and they take off the uniform, they can continue a long life as generations before them have done and give them the chance to pass on to their family members uh, about what they did, much as it took place generations before. But that, that key element of support and compassion uh, has to be first and foremost, especially as we know that uh, during some of these peacekeeping missions in the 1990s in the former Yugoslavia, for example, the full effect and impact of what it is that was witnessed during these missions doesn't come apparent in some cases for uh, a decade or more later. So they, there's a, a long act of, um, uh, a long period in which uh, people come to terms with their service, and that can take place in uniform and outside of uniform. And so supporting them while, uh, while they uh, uh, make that transition is, of course, of great importance. Uh, uh, when, we, when we talk about remembrance, I think that's it's definitely part of the debt that's owed. I think it's also worth recognizing that um, when it comes to p uh, peacekeeping service, uh, Cold War service, uh, Afghanistan, present day service, uh, the veterans themselves have had a very important role to play in uh, uh, working towards a better uh, agenda for re uh, remembrance and recognition. Uh, they are at the, many times at the vanguard of uh, moving forward and informing the public uh, about what their service has meant uh, to the country. And we see that in, say, the uh, the rededications of the National War Memorial in Ottawa, which was a joint effort between Second World War and Korean War veterans in, in uh, the 1980s. Uh, and uh, at the end of the Afghanistan mission, it was re, re, um, in 2014 when uh, Canada's contribution to that uh, mission ended, uh, that the National War Memorial was again rededicated uh, to recognize Canada's service in Afghanistan. Uh, so that uh, it happened at the end of the mission as opposed to almost uh, 30 years afterwards, as is the case in, in Korea. So there's definitely been some progress there. However, uh, we should first and foremost recognize that the uh, memory of those missions is being kept alive first and foremost uh, among the brothers and sisters in arms as they get together and, uh, and discuss and reminisce and uh, connect with each other uh, in uniform and out of uniform. And it enters the public sphere from there and it enters the history books from there. Um, I think that over the time at the War Museum, I've, I've attended, have the privilege to be invited to certain events uh, 
where important moments in the history of regiments or in the history of Canadian peacekeeping or in uh, uh, other missions has been recognized by those veterans. I was uh, at a reunion of the Canadian Airborne Regiment in uh, 2008 or thereabouts, uh, many of whom were there had served a pivotal mission in 1974 in Cyprus uh, when the uh, uh, the mission, uh, there was a Turkish intervention on the island in response to some unrest uh, that resulted in an active war zone breaking out where previously it had been a relatively peaceful peacekeeping mission with all sorts of changes to the day-to-day -day tempo of operations and a lot of valor that was shown in securing sites and making sure that the loss of life uh, was minimal and, and uh, that the UN's mandate was respected by uh, but that's a story that was known first and foremost within the regiment and within the military and uh, only now we're starting to get a bit more recognition as we head towards the uh, the anniversary of uh, of that event in uh, a few years time uh, i was also present at a reunion in 2016 of of uh, members of the royal canadian regiment reminiscing about the operation medusa mission uh in petalawa where uh, many still in uniform some out of uniform got together to reflect on what they had gone through 10 years earlier in the Battle of Panjway. Uh, and the stories they tell to each other in the mess hall, uh, some of them uh, not fit for publication, but some of them will, will end up being part of that national story. But that's only going to happen if there's a willingness to listen. So part of the focus when we talk about future commemoration should be to ask and connect with the veterans themselves uh, to go to where they are uh, commemorating uh, perhaps privately. And that's already being done not only in person and in mess halls, but increasingly in the uh, in the public sphere through Facebook groups, through uh, places where people are able to get together digitally and share photographs, share stories. And it's important for us to listen and to try to take in some of those lessons and build a bridge between these isolated communities of, of, uh, of veterans, perhaps online, uh, and uh, the various uh, uh, veterans associations that are uh, advocating for their causes and to build these bridges to create a map of remembrance of what it means for contemporary service uh, in the post-war period, and particularly in the post-Cold War period. Um, I think most Canadians would be floored to learn that nearly a thousand Canadian uh, air crew died in accidents and, and, uh, and problems during the over the course of the Cold War. Uh, although uh, we can see through more recent events, such as the crash of Stalker 22, uh, the cyclone in the Mediterranean on NATO operations where we lost six uh, Canadian Armed Forces members uh, that and the outpouring of, of grief uh, that took place over social media and, and uh, as the uh, remains were relocated and repatriated and, and flown back to Trenton, uh, there's definitely that connection. And I think that the choice of the Silver Cross mother this year, uh, uh, Deborah Sullivan, whose uh, son, uh, Lieutenant uh, Chris Saunders was lost in a 2004 Shikudumi fire, is, is HMS, HMCS Shikudumi fire, is a reminder of the, the costs of service, even during so-called peacetime. Uh, and there's a greater reflection, I think, uh, out there. So it's our responsibility to learn and support uh, veterans, uh, learn from them, but to also determine the best way for the broadest possible audience to learn from them. And that's partly on us as, uh, as, a, as a war museum, it's on uh, communities. But in some cases, that's not gonna be a memorial or a statue. It could be a change to curriculum. It could mean a greater collaborative efforts through uh, novel means such as the uh, platforms offered by social media. Uh, and it's really impossible to know what the future will hold in terms of uh, commemorative efforts, what statues will be built, by whom, because it's not always uh, government that builds them, it's, it's often uh, private associations uh, that become sites of remembrance and become sites of meaning. But it's very clear that a plurality of Canadians across the country, not just those in uniform or recently out of uniform, but ordinary Canadians, uh, want to learn more about their military past, to honor it, sometimes to question it, and that's uh, just the way that history is. And it's our job too as public history professionals to ensure that, uh, that we continue to explore that. Thank you, Andrew. And I, I would add that Veterans Affairs Canada also has a role to play in helping um, gather those stories and share them with Canadians. And I, I think we will be working together to ensure that happens over the years to come. Um, I'm mindful of the time. We've still got about 10 minutes left and we have a couple of questions from our, our viewers uh, out there in Canada. Um, one educator in Saskatchewan has asked us, has remarked that teachers have had to adjust um, to COVID-19 with more and more online and distance learning. And I'll, I'll direct this question to Melanie. 
um, comment pourrait-on faire évoluer les cérémonies traditionnelles de souvenirs afin de répondre aux, euh, aux réalités d'aujourd'hui et la croissance des activités virtuelles? Merci. C'est une très bonne question. Um, cette année, uh, il y a plusieurs cérémonies qui auront lieu en ligne. Donc, uh, ça, ça c'est définitivement um, un avantage uh, pour uh, les enseignants ou les parents, ou tout le monde qui veut, qui veut, veut suivre uh, les cérémonies. Donc, uh, uh, au Musée de la Guerre, par exemple, il y aura une, une cérémonie le, le 11 novembre en ligne. Pour les enseignants, j'ai mentionné un, un petit peu dans mes réponses ultérieures euh, des offres qui, qui ont euh, été euh, certaines développées dans les dernières années, mais aussi, comme j'ai mentionné, une offre du jour du souvenir qui est toute nouvelle, euh, qui a été euh, mise en ligne à la fin octobre. Donc, c'est un module du souvenir. Et ce module-là permet aux enseignants, euh, de, de, on, on va y trouver des scénarios pour établir des cérémonies du jour du souvenir. Donc, euh, je pense qu'à ce moment-là, c'est intéressant, soit avec la bulle classe euh, à l'école, même à la maison avec les enfants et euh, même les enseignants qui, qui enseignent en ligne peuvent euh, établir ces, ces cérémonies-là avec, avec leurs euh, élèves. Deuxième offre très importante du Musée de la guerre, euh, je crois que je l'ai mentionné un petit peu tantôt aussi, la ligne de ravitaillement. Donc, j'invite euh, les enseignants de n'importe où à travers le Canada, que vous enseignez en classe ou à la maison, à euh, aller sur notre site web pour trouver un, un formulaire. Vous pouvez euh, donc réserver nos boîtes de la Première Guerre mondiale ou de la Seconde Guerre mondiale en ligne. Et ce matériel-là va vous être, va vous être euh, euh, envoyé. Là. Donc, tout ça, c'est gratuit. Là. Donc, il y a plusieurs, euh, quelques dizaines de boîtes qui sont disponibles. Puis, elles, elles vous seront acheminées gratuitement. Donc, je vous invite à, à aller voir euh, sur notre site web www.musée-de-la-guerre.ca www.musée-de-la-guerre.ca euh, donc, j'espère que ça va aider aux enseignants cette année parce que j'avoue que c'est une situation euh, beaucoup plus difficile que d'habitude. Mais je pense que c'est vraiment important en temps de, de crise nationale euh, de, quand, de discuter de d'autres crises nationales puis comment on a passé à, à travers euh, avec les jeunes. C'est Ça fait partie, c'est un moment euh, important puis... Euh, il faut continuer quand même à, à, à se rappeler euh, du jour du souvenir euh, des, des, des autres moments difficiles qu'on a passé comme pays. I'll take the opportunity to put in a plug too for Veterans Affairs Canada's learning resources um, on veterans.gc.ca. We have a home learning corner and an array of videos and tools to help folks. Um, learn or or just engage in remembrance. Um, so I'll jump to another question. Uh, a viewer has noted that Indigenous women have served for many years in the military, yet have gotten little recognition or there's little historical information made available about them. How can we help youth and the general public learn more about different groups of Canadians who have contributed to Canada's military efforts over the years, especially underrepresented groups like women and Indigenous people. Maybe, Andrew, you could start us off. Certainly. Uh, the, uh, Melanie had made mention of the uh, supply line discovery boxes, which are available through the, um, uh, through the War Museum's website. A lot of the uh, online resources connected to those uh, discovery boxes contain a lot of information about uh, um, uh, some of the people from different communities across the country uh, who uh, 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 black Canadians, uh, Asian Canadians, uh, women in uniform. Uh, one of the uh, women that's, uh, that's featured in the Second World War supply, uh, supply line discovery box is leading aircraft woman Margaret Labillois, uh, who was uh, of, of, of a Mi'kmaq community in uh, uh, and she had enlisted uh, first to become a medic and ended up becoming a photo reconnaissance uh, 
uh, photo reconnaissance specialist uh, during the war and uh, after the war uh, became uh, very much a leader in uh, uh, veterans community, uh, First Nations veterans community uh, in her um, in her uh, home community. So these uh, these resources are available. It does take a little while to look at them because for a large part of uh, Canadian history, uh, there's been a very a tense relationship in some cases with uh, the service of Indigenous Canadians and uh, recognizing and uh, 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 both in service and after service uh, their endeavors. So we just passed yesterday, it was the National Indigenous Veterans Day. And uh, the uh, we hosted a webinar uh, yesterday where we were talking to uh, a veteran uh, who went through the whole history of, of Canada's uh, relationship uh, with Indigenous, uh, its Indigenous peoples and the Indigenous people service in the First World War and the Second World War. And there's a lot of uh, amazing stories of service that come out of that of those wars. Uh, Tommy Prince uh, from the both the Second World War and Korea is often an example that's cited. Uh, but uh, these uh, examples of heroism and service took place against a backdrop where uh, the service was not always welcome, that there was not always uh, the uh, uh, level of, of embrace of Canada's diversity uh, and active policies discouraging um, uh, either the service of Indigenous Canadians or, uh, or people of colour uh, from serving in the armed forces. Uh, policies that were later rescinded during wartime emergency and uh, but took some time uh, for the informal restrictions to lift. But there's also uh, the longer effort to ensure that proper recognition and uh, uh, compensation for their service was respected. And that was the work of a uh, generation of uh, uh, Canada's Indigenous people to get the same benefits as those uh, other Canadians who served, uh, uh, given the, uh, the complexities of the Indian Act and some of the uh, uh, to ensure that they were they were given the same same rights. So I mean, th tens uh, more than ten thousand uh, Indigenous Canadians served in the Canadian Armed Forces uh, throughout the years. Uh, the numbers are a little harder to estimate, but certainly uh, we see in the current defense policy that's out there that there's a, a very active and interest uh, in enhancing the diversity of the Armed Forces to embrace the full strength uh, of Canada. And uh, so those people who did serve and who distinguished themselves were uh, the vanguard of those people, uh, a vanguard of those who could have served, but perhaps were discouraged and, and we lost that potential. And so it's important that as we go forward, uh, we pay attention to and enhance the potential of all those who, uh, who wish to serve and remember those who did, um, much as we discussed earlier. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. And Mélanie, veux tu ajouter quelque chose? Oui? Oui, certainement. J'ajouterais euh, en ce qui concerne euh, l'histoire des femmes militaires aussi. Euh, mon collègue euh, en a parlé, mais j'aimerais mentionner qu'il ne faut pas oublier que les femmes font partie euh, des campagnes militaires canadiennes depuis les années 1800. Donc, on, on parle par exemple de la campagne du Nord-Ouest en 1885, euh, la guerre d'Afrique du Sud, il y a des milliers d'infirmières militaires qui servent pendant les deux guerres mondiales, plus de 50 000 Canadiennes servent pendant la Seconde Guerre mondiale et donc ça, et ça se poursuit par la suite. Donc euh, oui, je comprends euh, euh, la, la, la personne qui nous demande pourquoi on, on connaît très peu leur histoire. Euh, C'est euh, une des raisons qui m'a menée vers euh, ce domaine d'études moi aussi. Euh, J'ose espérer que, euh, au cours des 30 et plus dernières années, on commence à combler ce vide historiographique. Il faut comprendre que <coughs> pardon, ça reflète euh, l'histoire des femmes en général aussi. Donc, ça reflète euh, les courir, le courant historiographique, euh, l'histoire socio-militaire. Donc, euh, Je suis vraiment désolée. Donc, euh, ce qu'on voit dans les dernières années euh, comme historienne guerre et société, un de mes objectifs premiers, c'est de redonner la, une voix à ces gens-là qui traditionnellement euh, n'en ont pas eu dans, dans l'histoire euh, militaire ou l'histoire sociale. Donc, et je crois que c'est un objectif très important aussi pour mes collègues ou mes autres collègues au Musée de la guerre et pour euh, 
bon nombre d'historiens de nos jours. Donc, j'ai vraiment confiance qu'on s'en va vers une histoire qui va être canadienne qui va être de plus en plus inclusive. Merci beaucoup. Eh bien, malheureusement, nous avons atteint la fin de notre, de, de notre heure ensemble, notre première table ronde sur le passé et l'avenir de la commémoration au Canada. J'aimerais remercier très, très sincèrement Mélanie, Andrew et Tim de s'être rejoints à nous aujourd'hui pour partager vos, vos perspectives très importantes, intéressantes et vos, vos, votre expertise, en fait. And I hope uh, our viewers will tune in to us again when we have our next series of panels as we continue to explore important themes surrounding remembrance in our country. We'll let you know when the next one is taking place. Thank you very much.